My name is Chris Berry. I'm from the School of Earth and Ocean Sciences at Cardiff University. And in this school, we study the environment of the Earth from the very deep parts of the Earth through the crust up into the atmosphere. And we study the past of the planet, the present planet, and we look to the future of the planet as things change. I'm going to talk a little bit today about my interest in fossil plants and particularly the earliest forests that lived on the Earth. These forests lived during the Devonian period, which is a period from 420 to about 360 million years ago. And these are the forests which preceded the Carboniferous forests, the ones that you might be familiar with from, for example, the museum here in Cardiff. These forests in the Carboniferous that formed the coal seams that were the backbone of the economy of South Wales for so many years. But I'm interested in how these forests originated, how during the Devonian the vegetation turned from very small plants that were the first to evolve on the land and gradually got bigger, became more diverse. The plants began to form trees and then to form forests. And there was a massive transformation of the earth from a, a planet which is essentially very primitive to one which is much more modern in the way it worked. I see plants as being the interface between the solid planet and the atmosphere. So plants mine minerals and water from the soil and then they exchange gases with the atmosphere. They take out carbon dioxide and they release oxygen into the atmosphere. So they're a very important part of the way that the earth works. Plants contain virtually all of the Earth's terrestrial biomass and there's lots of little animals and things running around but they're pretty much insignificant when it comes to where the carbon is in the terrestrial ecosystems. So if you think of the environment of the past you probably have in your mind um, scenes from books or Jurassic Park. Um, and these scenes are generally dominated by animals. So there's obviously usually a big dinosaur or something in the front of the picture or the image or the movie. But if you go back into the Devonian, there weren't really any animals around on the Earth's surface. The ones that were there were small insects and uh, millipedes and things like that. And it was only at the end of the Devonian period that uh, uh, vertebrate animals started to emerge onto the land. So when we reconstruct past environments back into the Devonian and we try to imagine what the forests were like at that time, we don't have to put animals in front of the plants. So at this time we can let the plants steal the show. They're the most important thing to try to visualise and reconstruct. So what I'm going to do now is show you a picture of a reconstruction of the Gilboa fossil forest from about 385 million years ago, which is known as the earliest fossil forest, but it's not quite the earliest fossil forest. And it represents many, many decades of work by paleontologists all over the planet trying to visualise and reconstruct this ancient environment. In this reconstruction, the tallest trees are called cladoxylopsid trees, and that, that name cladoxylopsid is probably very unfamiliar to most people. Um, that's because these plants are extinct. They were the first most important trees during the Devonian period, and they flourished for a long while, but then they died out at the end of the Devonian period. So how do you reconstruct a tree which is extinct and in fact which had a unique way of growing and it's quite unlike anything that's alive today. The first thing to do is field work. Field work is a great motivation to be a geologist because we get to get outside and do exciting things in exciting places. We have to choose an area which has rocks of the right age that we're interested in, here about 385 million years old, and then we use historical information 
perhaps gleaned from libraries and archive collections as to where people have collected fossils in the past. And then we plan how to get there. And sometimes that's very easy. You just fly there and maybe hire a car or you, you drive there or uh, you catch a bus or something very simple. But occasionally it's more complex than that. It re can require months, if not years of planning, uh, fundraising and so on. And some of these more extreme adventures can turn out to be very, very exciting indeed. For example, um, flying onto a rocky beach in East Greenland or hiring a boat for three weeks to drive around the north coast of Spitsbergen. These are just things that one has to do in order to be where you want to be and they can turn into great adventures in their own right. And then you get there and you look for fossils and you collect fossils from outcrops um, in a process which is hard to describe but it's just one of really searching and using your experience to determine which parts of the rock successions are most likely to have fossil plants in them and you uh, get them out and you wrap them up in newspaper or something similar and then you bring them back to the lab. The real problem with working on fossil plants like these is that like dinosaurs, fossil trees tend to fall apart when they die and you end up with lots of small bits which don't necessarily indicate how they can be connected back together again. So the paleontologist has to use their experience to try to reconstruct these plants using the individual little bits, matching up how they might occur with each other. And sometimes you can use material from one place that you've collected yourself. Other times you use your visual memory to remember where you've seen things before which are similar. And sometimes you can suddenly remember that you've seen something in a museum 20 years ago which might fit uh, to the plant that you're looking at. But to make a real breakthrough, what you need to do is, is find increasingly complete tree fossils. And in fact, with these cladozolopsid trees, which have been known from their bits for 150 years, it's only in the last 10, 15 uh, years that we've really come to understand what these trees look like as complete organisms. And this is because in both in Germany, uh, working with Peter Giesen, and in New York State, working with Bill Stein and colleagues at the New York State Museum, we've actually found more or less complete trees, some of these on incredibly large pieces of rock. So we can be increasingly confident that our reconstructions of these individual plants, like the cladozolopsids, for example, are more and more accurate, that they look very much like they actually did when they were alive. But how do we reconstruct those plants into forests, into their original ecology? Well, we've been lucky enough that there's three places in the world where we can see these ancient forests and the bases of the trees preserved exactly where they were when they were alive 380, 385 million years ago. One of those is in Spitsbergen, where we can see the bases of club moss trees, lycopods, um, looking very much as if they were a miniature version of the coal forests that you would have found in South Wales in the Carboniferous. In Cairo in New York State, we very recently described uh, fossil soil which includes vast rooting systems of a woody tree called Archaeopteris and uh, this has been published in Current Biology very recently. But the most famous example is the Gilboa fossil forest where um, since 1920s uh, fossil trees have been known but the quarry has only recently been cleared out again we were able to study the bottom of the forest over uh, many hundreds of square metres and Bill Stein and colleagues at the New York State Museum were able to make a map of the floor of the entire quarry. There we see the space in the cladozolopsid trees which are very close together and also lying between them a woody sort of rhizome which bore aerial branches of a plant which is called a neurophyte. And so that's how we can come up with the exact ecology of the 
ancient forests. And we feed that information to an artist. In this case, the artist is Victor Leszek in United States of America. And he will take that information that we've given him on spacing and the morphology of the plants and convert that into an image, which we then suggest corrections to, and he responds to the corrections. But at the same time, he adds his own artistic interpretation. In this case, his uh, purpose was to create a cover for the magazine Nature. And so therefore he's given a unique um, visual representation and a, a unique viewpoint, which um, makes a, a very good impression on the cover of a scientific journal. So what's the significance of these forests now that we know that they occurred earlier in Earth history than people thought and now that we know that the plants involved were much bigger than people thought possible at that time? Well plants today and plants in the past remove carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and they incorporate the carbon into their structural tissues such as wood. And that wood can break down into smaller particles which are incorporated into the sedimentary record or the wood can form fossils or the wood can form coal seams and so that carbon from the atmosphere has now permanently been incorporated into the rock record or almost permanently. The action of plant roots also has a separate but similar effect of taking carbon out of the atmosphere and by some mineralogical means getting rid of it into the rock record. So plants increasing in abundance would have led to the removal of large amounts of carbon dioxide from the atmosphere which is then incorporated into the rock record. And so global temperatures would have dropped and in fact by the beginning of the Carboniferous then ice caps appear in the southern hemisphere. So there was a great global change at that time. The geochemical cycles changed and the atmospheric composition changed significantly. The presence of plants particularly on floodplains, would also have affected the way that sediment moved around the planet, how fine muddy particles were created on floodplains and how sand was transported and trapped on the surface of the planet. This would have affected the way that sediment reached the oceans and what type of sediment reached the oceans at this time. The other potential outcome of this is that microhabitats were created, humid habitats, shady habitats, variation of habitats which would allow the diversification of insects and plant-eating insects and would have allowed um, the diversification of plants in various different habitats. The increase in the proportion of oxygen in the atmosphere because of the withdrawal of carbon dioxide might also have allowed flying insects to develop because there was enough oxygen for them to be able to use energy really quickly and also um, the increase of oxygen would have led to um, the increase in wildfires and, and, and burning of habitats. It's interesting to see now that our research is being used very widely in, by people who model the way that the atmosphere has changed and how the climate has changed over time and in fact we're involved in some of that research ourselves. It's also great to see that our research and particularly these reconstructions of fossils and the reconstructions of the trees are gradually finding their way into children's books and into popular science books and it's really amazing to see the impact that these visual records of our past are having on the way that the general public perceive the evolution of the planet and it's also good to see that our images and our concepts of these early forests are beginning to be incorporated into major works of art and public art.